So we start this afternoon's session um, with the application mentoring panel. And I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Kit Windows Yule. Now, specifically, I have chosen him to come today because he has a very Christmassy name. This way. <laughs> very magical. <laughs> Sorry? It's my only qualification. Uh, yes, hardly. <laughs> anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Kit. Um, he is a lecturer at the University of Birmingham School of Chemical Engineering. He works jointly with the School of Physics and Astronomy's Positron, I can't even say it. Positron. Positron <laughs> Imaging Centre. I hope that means something to you guys. And is a two-time Royal Academy of Engineering Industrial Fellow and also a Turing Fellow as well. And something else which it really qualifies Kit to chair this panel is that he sits on the expert panel and the decision panel when we take um, when we take the final applicants through to decision. So he is very well qualified to take us through this um, panel exercise. Um, I will leave Kit to introduce the panel. I'm going to be sitting on it as well, um, but um, I will hand over to Kit. Thank you. Good. OK, so this is my talk about how to develop a competitive application, which is exactly what it sounds like on the tin. OK, so I'm going to start with a little icebreaker, pun absolutely intended, because it's the fire triangle. Can anybody tell me what this is and what it means? And it's not a trick question. Anybody? You made eye contact. Have you never met the fire triangle? <laughs> Who, have you not done safety training at your institute? Yeah, it's, the three, it's, the three different... it's the three different components needed to start a fire. And what happens if you remove any one of those components? Uh, the fire goes out. The fire dies. OK, so what I'm going to try and introduce to you today is my own copyrighted idea of the funding triangle. OK, so just like the fire triangle, you get rid of the oxygen, the fire dies. You get rid of the heat, the fire dies. You get rid of the fuel, the fire dies. If any one of these three elements is not there, if you haven't got an excellent application, if you, ha if you haven't got an excellent idea, if you haven't got an excellently written application, if any one of those is missing, your funding opportunity dies. Does anybody want to have a guess of which of these three is the one that's most commonly missing from the applications that I reject? Heat. heat. Um, to be fair, I work a lot in pyrolysis, so um, no, there's a lot of heat in the applications I review sometimes. Is it excellently written application? It is indeed. Um, and the reason I present it like this is because too few people realise that even if you're an absolutely brilliant applicant and you've got a fantastic idea, but you can't put it down on paper. It's like having a car with a really big engine but really, really crap tyres. OK, just, it's not going to go anywhere. OK, so this is kind of what this entire talk is about. You wouldn't be in this room if you weren't excellent. I don't think you'd have bothered showing up if you didn't have a really good idea. So I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about how to write a good application. The nice thing about this application is it's pretty short, OK, which is always a bonus with these things. You talk about your education and employment history, which hopefully you all know by heart. You give a research statement. You give a statement of interest for the enrichment scheme. You, and then you give some, it says an example, singular. Generally speaking, it's best to have a few examples of your technical skills and of your collaboration and communication skills, OK? I will go into all of this in much more detail part by part. So the application question about your research statement, there's a few kind of general tips. Don't just copy and paste stuff from other proposals for many reasons. Demonstrate how your research is relevant to the Turing. That's kind of one of the key things and one thing that's very often missing is that you're applying specifically for a piece of funding from the Turing Institute. And if it's not related to the Turing, it probably makes sense to go for another scheme. Okay, we want to see why what you're writing about is drawing specifically on the strengths of this institute. Um, and this relationship to the Turing, it doesn't have, there's millions of ways you can relate to the Turing because there's millions of things they do. You can talk about ethics, you can talk about education in AI, you can talk about specific AI tools that you use that the Turing might be interested in, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is to show some kind of relevance of the Turing to your work and some kind of relevance of your work to the Turing. Um, and I'm going to present to you throughout this little talk 
an example of a winning application. So this was actually from one of my students, uh, Leonard Nikushan, his name is, who was rated joint top of all applications in the last round of the enrichment scheme. So he's a very, very good example. OK, can anybody have a, have a quick scan through this? Can anybody tell me some things that immediately jump out at you about this and that you think might immediately jump out to a reviewer when they read this? Anything at all? Yes, uh, microphone. She picked up on some, yes, there we are. Um, so one of the things he does very well here, he does it twice actually, so he talks about his industrial partners and then he calls back again to his industrial partners. So name checking some high profile collaborations, showing that your research is valuable because you've worked with some important people or companies or institutes is really useful. The other thing I've highlighted here that you should try and do without this is he's provided some evidence. He's casually just thrown in a reference to a very high profile publication he was involved in. And the thing that he's done extremely well here is he's related it back to the Turing's work. So he's not just saying, I'm great, I do this really cool stuff, I get published in high profile journals and I work with all these companies. He's also saying, what I'm doing is directly relevant to the Turing. And more importantly, what he's saying here you know, he knows what the Turing does. So he knows that they're doing research into combinatorial optimization, which shows that he hasn't just applied for this because on a wing and a prayer, he actually really wants to work with this institute. And that's kind of an understatedly important thing to be doing. Next application question um, is a statement of interest, OK? So this is both saying why you want to apply, but also trying to say, you know, what am I going to do with this funding? You don't have to have a step-by-step -step plan. But equally well, it doesn't want to appear that you're just going to take this £1,000, stick it in your back pocket, and then do what you were going to do anyway. OK? There has to be a clear plan for what you're doing with this funding. And here's the crucial... One of the real things that people don't tend to put across very well, big part of this scheme is... Well, you've got to ask the question, why do you want to go and work at another institute if you've got everything you need at your institute, if that makes sense? OK? So demonstrate what you can't get at your home university that you could get through working with the Turing Institute. If you can't do that, we're not going to give you the funding because, well, we don't need to. Your, your university's got it covered. We can spend that £1,000 on, on someone else. So some examples here, things that are done well. So he's demonstrating relevant knowledge of the Turing again. So he's talking about um, wanting to work with DeepMind, who are a Turing collaborator. I'm pleased to say one of the first things he did when he got on the enrichment scheme was come down to look London and meet DeepMind, and they're now actually starting to look at a collaboration together. Um, knows that the seminar's going on, knows which sort of area of research he wants to engage with, and he's got a very clear plan of what he wants to do with the money. Um, and he's actually, this is kind of sort of another kind of kill two birds with one stone thing here, because it's, I've got a clear plan for what I want to do with the money, but it's also extremely data science focused. It's talking about wanting to use CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, and specific facilities belonging to the Turing Centre. And the one last thing here is he also demonstrates support from his own institute and from his supervisor. So if you can do that, if you can get your supervisors or your head of school to actually support your application, you know, if he wins this thousand pounds, we'll give it a little top up so that he can go and talk about his experience at this conference. Then it looks like people, you know, it looks like you've got the kind of support that we want you to have. So for the research proposal, kind of a, a brief list of do's and don'ts. Um, the main one here um, that I always try and flag as heavily as possible: <laughs> don't just if you. Don't go for this scheme because you've had a research proposal rejected from another scheme and you want to see if it flies here, because it won't. If you copy and paste another research proposal, it's by definition not going to be related to the Turing. It's not going to read like it was for this scheme. And even if it's a really lovely idea, it's going straight out of the door. OK? Generally speaking, don't be vague or unclear. Be very specific. You've only got, like, a few thousand words. So be very targeted and say exactly, specifically, what you want to do and how you want to do it. And again, be specific with the techniques you're going to use. OK? I'm going to use neural networks to solve the climate crisis. OK? That, that's not the kind of thing we want to do. We want some specificity. 
you know, which neural networks are, going to, are you going to use and how are you going to use them to solve the climate crisis? Put some steps in for us, please. Um, as for the good things, um, make clear and realistic research goals is actually kind of what I was just saying here. And if this is something you're not sure exactly how to do it, um, then talk to your supervisor. Because by definition, if they're in the position they're in, they will have got a lot of research funding themselves and they'll know how to do this kind of stuff. Have specific goals, as I said. Don't just wave a neural network at it and hope it magically disappears. Have some specific goals and some specific techniques you want to use. And make sure that you've thought about collaborations, OK? Don't assume that they're going to come to you. Don't assume you're going to reanimate the corpse of Stephen Hawking and work with him, OK? We want realistic ideas for collaborations, OK? So integrate them in a meaningful manner. The other sort of kind of crucial point to this is it's not, don't just sort of, don't throw, don't throw AI at it for no reason, OK? It wants to be a problem that can only be solved with AI, not just, well, I've got this good idea and I'll tack a neural network on it so that I can put it into this Turing process. Make sure that what you're doing is integral to your project, OK? So this is kind of the broad overall stuff. So these are the areas, this is kind of, the cheat sheet. I won't read through this line by line because we'll be here all afternoon. But my suggestion is when you look at these slides afterwards, we give you a cheat sheet for this. We tell you exactly what you need to do to get the funding. And you'd be amazed how many people don't bother actually reading this. Or if they do, it sure as heck doesn't look like it. OK, so engage with the Turing like I keep hammering home. Making sure it's technically sound. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we kind of do by default. Uh, so I'm not going to labour this point. Clearly identify um, areas for development. Okay, this is one that people tend to be weak on. You kind of get a lot of people when they're going for an application feel like they have to make them out to be this invulnerable god of data science. I am the absolute king of data science. I can do it all. Whereas a big part of this application is identifying chinks in the armour, is identifying things that you would like to be developed in, because a big part of this process is for developing you as candidates, not just giving a perfectly developed candidate a small amount of money to go and do some AI with, OK? Um, then I'll talk about skills and behaviours in the next couple of slides, OK? So again, um, don't, don't, again, the same thing. Don't use AI as a magic wand. A weaker applicant might not have many skills, but even if you don't have fantastic skills, you should still have a base to build upon. So we're not, again, expecting you all to be sort of absolute AI experts, but if you've got a good foundational knowledge to build on and you've got a really good idea, we will still accept your application. And of course, crucially, it's not just about the AI skills. If you work in one area, you know, if you work in, in zoology and your proposal is about building a nuclear reactor, then again, probably going to be rejected, even if the nuclear reactor design sounds quite good, because you don't, you're not going to be able to prove you have the skills to solve the research goals. OK? Um, what you should do, demonstrate the skills needed. I mean, that, I'm hoping that's blindingly obvious. Um, demonstrate skill through academic training, work experience, internships, courses, or self-teaching. So this is kind of saying, not just saying anybody can say, yes, I can use AI really well. But if you can demonstrate a bunch of training, a bunch of past work, a body of work you've created using AI, um, some courses, maybe a GitHub that shows it, that's very, very different. OK? So remember with skills as well, there's two parts to skills. There's technical skills, OK? So that is your actual scientific ability, your coding ability, your ability to use machine learning, AI, whatever else. Um, so you can prove that by if you've got a GitHub, you've got a lot of stars, you've got a lot of forks, you've got a lot of people contributing to it. If you've taken on a significant role in a research grant, some of you might even have won a small research grant before, then that's again a demonstration of technical skills. Um, do you have any related publications demonstrating these skills? All fairly standard. The harder part is demonstrating the soft skills, okay? Your ability to collaborate, your ability to work interdisciplinarily. Um, have you led a significant project? Have you hosted a workshop? Have you per participated in a collaborative event or helped organise one or whatever else? So again, 
an example from Leonard's application. So his soft skills, he demonstrates very, very well indeed. Um, he does a clever thing here where he kills two birds with one stone. So he talks about being a co-PI on a data study group. If you don't know what a data study group is, please talk to me or Jules or Harriet about those because they're absolutely fantastic things um, that the Turing runs. But he, he was a co-PI, so he was a co-lead on one of these things. Um, he worked with a group of young researchers, blah, 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 worked with different universities. But he's showing here leadership. He's also showing an ability collaboratively. And he's also showing that he's worked with the Turing before, all of which are really strong points for an application. He's also showing he's worked on funded projects and that he's played a crucial role in developing them that has some relation to AI and data science. And he's demonstrated that his work has led to tangible success. Okay, Tangible success doesn't have to be money necessarily. It can be a high-profile publication, a news article, something like that. But showing that what you've done has some real-world value is really, really useful. Okay, So a weaker application might assume opportunities and collaborations and etc will just fall into place and um, they might just repeat the objectives of the scheme they might provide generic statements out of interest with all this stuff you know the assuming collaborations will come to you um, the copy and pasting an old article an old research proposal across um, just repeating the aims and objectives of the scheme instead of writing something original what's the common thread between all these things What's the common thread between all these things? Anybody? You made eye contact. It lacks the lack of thought. Uh, yeah. In the applications. Laziness. <coughs> Laziness is the common thread. Laziness, a lazy application jumps off the page at you. It jumps off the page at you. And if, I, if something starts to look lazy, I've almost rejected it immediately. Because my thought process is, even if you've got a great idea, is this person going to have the gusto to actually follow it through? OK, and it makes it very difficult. If someone's demonstrated to me that they're lazy, it's very hard for me to then trust them with the Turing's money. OK, so it's a really important point. So a strong application, show evidence. They may be soft skills, but you've got to show hard evidence of them. And it's very easy to be wishy-washy and talk about wishy-washy things, again, because it's a soft skill. People think they can be soft with it. But give specific examples. Do you have a repository with a lot of contributors? Have you done collaborative work? Have you held collaborative meetings? That kind of stuff. Um, so I'll cut it off there. But um, so the reason I'm talking about all this is because I'm an academic mentor for this scheme. So as well as being on the panel, I actually work with applicants to help them develop their skills. And there's a lot of us about with expertise in different <laughs> domains. So if you're interested in that, and then come and talk to me or come and talk to Jane and we can tell you how to get involved with it. OK, so that's the talky part. Uh, the next part is the, uh, the mentor panel discussion. So if our mentors could come and join us on the stage, please. And if you'd like to, uh, to introduce yourselves. So we'll start with, uh, we'll start with you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm B. Costa Gomes. I'm currently a postdoc um, at the Turing, but I was also an enrichment student in the 2019 cohort, so you know before COVID. Um, and I'm also an application uh, mentor. I've had mentees that entered the the program, so a successful <laughs> mentor. And I also helped with the review, so that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I'm Alex. Um, that is me on the slide, although um, I've gone for a different, different style of hair these, these days. Um, so we had a bit of debate before starting as to who's got the longest title. <laughs> Mine's quite a bit longer, it's on the screen here, um, I'm afraid. So I'm mainly based at the University of Manchester. I'm an electronic engineer by background. I don't sit there anymore. I sit in the Royce Institute for Advanced Materials. So that's kind of the advanced materials equivalent. It's not that there's a few complexities, but the equivalent of um, Turing. I then got an appointment in the medical school at the University of Leeds and an appointment um, in clinical engineering in um, Northern Care Alliance, which is one of our NHS trusts. Um, and then also a fellow of the Turing Institute um, and, and, like my colleagues here, have been a, a mentor um, on, on this scheme in the, in, in, in the past. 
So my work is about kind of wearable devices. We've got a lot of work about flexible electronics, so kind of devices which can flex and stretch um, around your, your, your skin and, and whatnot. And so we've done a lot of work with, say, the UK Biobank, um, the wearable data that's in there, um, and then also kind of real-time power and time-constrained machine learning. Thanks. As you know, um, I'm Jane Formston, and so I am the student and academic recruitment manager. So it's my job to be in charge of the call uh, for the enrichment scheme. And um, within my team, we write the call document and also the FAQs. Um, we sweat blood and tears over those documents. We also work with the skills um, team. Um, and Vera Matza, who can't be here today, is really in charge of the programme. Um, and we work very closely with her. And you're going to hear from Harriet as well, who's the um, academic training manager. Um, is that because, yeah. <laughs> and um, so we work very, very closely with that team to make sure that we are delivering the right, we're going to call, be calling for the right um, kind of students. As I alluded to earlier, we tweak it every year because the world changes. You change, we change. You know, we're not in a pandemic anymore, so we've changed again. So um, I'll come on to talk about the call document and the FAQs um, later, but um, I will hammer home those points. Okie dokie. So while you guys think about some questions or if you're feeling too shy to ask them in person, put them on the Slido. Um, I'll start off with a question for all of the panel, which is uh, what our top tips are for writing an application. So I'll, I'll start with mine. And my top tip for applying for the Turing Enrichment Scheme is to write an application for the Turing Enrichment Scheme. And what I mean by that is not writing an application for EPSRC and then submitting it to the Turing Enrichment Scheme. Not writing one for the RA end and then submitting it to the Turing Enrichment Scheme, but actually really knowing what the purpose of this scheme is. Okay, so reading the questions carefully, answering the questions that were actually answered. I'm getting a few puzzled looks here. I'm guessing you've never reviewed an application for a grant before because one thing that you always get is people saying what they would like to say with complete disregard for whether it's actually relevant to the questions that's been asked, if that makes sense. And it's, it's, really, it's a really sad thing because sometimes you get brilliant people with brilliant ideas, but they're not, you know, the, the questions I showed on that board earlier, they are what we have to mark you against, okay? They're very strict criteria. And if you have said some wonderful things, but that don't give us any insight into whether you've met those criteria or not, we can't accept the proposal because we can't score you highly in those areas. So my key tip is make it a proposal for the Turing Enrichment Scheme, not just here's a good idea and I'm going to write it down. OK? B. Um, so I, I'm going to actually give two tips. So I'm going off. <laughs> uh, but my first tip is very quick and is apply. I know it sounds really silly, but rule number one, and you should apply. Uh, so you're not going to get it if you don't apply. So I always say this if anyone asks me, What's my first tip is that. My second tip as a student that went through the writing the application and also as a mentor is don't do it um, all in one, one go. So divide it into chunks and come back to what you already wrote. wrote. Um, you will have a fresh mind to look at the answers that you gave and you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be in the mindset that you wrote them in. So you might actually notice things that you haven't before and you might notice that you haven't answered the question, um, which is a very important thing. So those are my two biggest tips. Um, and I'd like to give two as well, if, that, if that's <laughs> OK. Um, so the first is, is quite similar, actually, um, phrased slightly differently, which would be to talk to people, um, your mentors, your supervisors, about your application. Right? You might be sitting there thinking, I've never worked with Google. I've never got that DOI I can put in my application. I don't have, I've got a GitHub, but it doesn't have lots of stars. Um, but you've probably, and certainly in my experience, you've got more than you think, actually. People forget all of the stuff that they've done and actually have a conversation with somebody to be kind of, well, what, what about this bit? Why didn't you mention that? But you can get a whole loads of stuff that you just didn't occur the first time you sat down and, and did it. 
And this applies all the way up. You'll see professors doing this on their applications as well, forgetting to log stuff. Um, the second tip would be about using frameworks. I would be quite a fan um, of, of, of doing this, because again, it's easy to forget stuff. Um, being specific, I think, came up in the talk, um, and that's really important. It's easy to talk about AI in, in general. Um, the framework of relevance to this is probably the STAR framework, and I can never remember exactly what it stands for, but uh, giving a situation, giving the task that you had to do, the action that you took, and then the result that you got. And what I would suggest, you've only got a couple of hundred words, right? But you can write those headings, write a sentence for each, delete the headings, and that's your first, that's your first go. And you might need to do that for you know, three or four times for just one of those boxes, and then you can merge it and, and whatnot. But I wouldn't just start with a blank page and just start type it, typing in. Thanks, I've got several. <laughs> first things first, the deadline is the 18th of January. There's no extensions, okay? Um, my department are in charge of that. We won't offer any extensions. It's so oversubscribed. Um, you would be amazed the amount of emails we get with some very, very interesting excuses um, as to why people can't submit on time. We've made it so easy for you this year. Um, previously, your supervisor had to submit their reference before you could submit your application. Your references will be called after you have received an informal offer. So A, we're not wasting your supervisor's time if you haven't, um, if you're not successful. Um, and you could submit it without having to rely on somebody else. So the onus is on you to get it in by the 18th of January, okay? My second point is read the call document. Read the FAQs. They are full of information. And if you're not sure, email us, ask. We're around. We're around for, you know, we're, we're not around for the Christmas period, but we're also offering an online session as well on the 11th of January just to help mop up any extra questions. Sign up for that through events um, and you'll be given an access code. Use everything to your disposal, really. That, that's my, my piece of advice. And then finally, we've talked about the mentoring. If you are at a non-partner university or what we call a Turing Network um, Development Award university or institution, then you're eligible to apply um, to be matched with an application mentor, somebody who can help you with your application. That doesn't mean they're going to write it. That doesn't mean that they're going to rewrite it. You've got to actually show that you have started the application. Now, the deadline for applying for that mentorship is actually on Monday the 12th. So if you're really serious about applying for the scheme, then you need to get that application in over the weekend, ready for Monday, so we can match you with a mentor. Over the weekend, you need to start your application because it's no good sort of us matching you with a mentor and you don't make the most of it. There isn't a huge amount of time. We're over halfway through the call now. So I think if you walk away today going, I'm serious about this, then the ball's in your court, okay? For those who are at partner universities, you have something called a ULM, which is a university liaison manager. Please approach them. They will put you in contact with somebody. It might be a Turing Fellow. It might be someone connected who might be able to help you. Again, none of these people can guarantee you a place on the scheme. So just to give you a bit of an idea, last year we had 247 applications. We awarded 107 or 111, I'm looking at, at Harriet, <laughs> seven, thank you, <laughs> 107 places. Now that was for the Community Award, which is the online award, and also the Placement Award. Bear in mind, we're not offering community this year, so we have 55 places, placement places available, and we're fully expecting the same number of applicants. So it's actually probably going to be even more competitive. So read, 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 please, and don't miss the deadline. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. You've actually headed off one of the questions from the Slido without even having <laughs> me read it, which is really impressive. Um, and I think, uh, I think, Alex, you've started us off 
on on one of the other questions, which was, how would you even begin writing the application? Good springboard tip. So I think you gave us some, so quite a lot of insight in there. Does anybody else have anything to, to add to that? I liked B's um, contribution, which was, don't try and do it all in one go. We can, we can track you on Flexi Grant. We can see, it gives me a percentage of, of how much you have done. Um, and I go on perhaps once a week just to see there are 100 people already drafting. Four have completed. Everybody else sits between having 13% completed. That means you've done your name and address. <laughs> and then um, there are other people who've done 50%. They've started to make an inroad. So we can track how much you've, you've done. Um, don't leave it all to the last minute either. Absolutely, that's not going to win you any prizes. So... So my, my sort of top tip for this, and this is genuinely how I, how I write research proposals, um, is firstly just start with an empty Word document or an empty LaTeX file or whatever you like to, to write in with the questions that you're supposed to be answering. Or even better, if you've got kind of the cheat sheet like you have here, the criteria you're going to get marked against. So I would write down all the criteria that I'm going to get marked against. And then in a separate tab, I have a document. I recommend everybody write one of these documents where I have listed every good thing I have ever done in my research career. So all my fellowships, all my publications in high impact factor journals, all my collaborations with big institutions, the work I do for the Turing, just a big sprawling list. And then what I try to do is I look from one to the other, especially with the skills section here, the hard skills and the soft skills sections. I just think, right, that could go in there, that could go in there, that could go in there. Just bullet points, you know. Here's, and then I've got everything that I could possibly apply to my skills listed in there in order of how important I think it is. And then that just gives you something really rough and ugly to start building around. And you can do something similar for the other points. So that's for the kind of skills criteria. And then for the research project criteria, hopefully you've got a good idea of what you want to actually do in your head, or maybe you've even drafted it down in general terms, and you just do the same thing. How, which bits of this idea fulfill these application criteria? And then what you end up with is a list of criteria and a list of things that fulfill that criteria, and then you just have to make it flow between those. Then you just have to write the nice English around it. And you can find that you get much less writer's block if you're not trying to write, but you're just making a list. That, that's my way of doing it. Can't say it's a silver bullet, but it, it's very easy to get started. Do you have any to add? I just want to add that just started. It feels like very overwhelming. And again, I've, I've been there, right? I wrote my application all those years ago, and it felt like so overwhelming. I had this huge thing to do. And then just start it, like literally open the document and you, when you notice you've wrote way too many words and now you're like, oh man, I'm amazing, I need to cut things down. I can show all of my uh, prompts <coughs> in one go. So yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Yep. Um, my, my advice for starting would be to what, do what I would call design the grant. Right? I wouldn't necessarily start by typing stuff into the flexi grant boxes. Yeah. Um, a, a blank word document is, is, is fine. But in, in my experience, we write the actual final words quite quickly once we've designed what it is we want to do, what's in scope, what's not in scope, and where do you want to get to, what do you need to convey in those words. And this becomes really important when you get to um, big multi-partner grants, which you know, you, you, you'll get to in the course of your, your, your career, where if everyone's not on the same page, putting those 400 words together is just impossible because you're pulling in different directions. I would design, spend time designing, and then write. Brilliant. Um, so we've got a, I think that probably quite a quick question here actually. Um, what if the only technical skills one can demonstrate are those exhibited for a master's assignment? And I think this goes back, I'm not sure if it was B or Alex that said this, um, but who, who was it that said you've done more than you think? Was that you? Um, I think the short answer is unless for the last five years of your life all you did was get up in the morning, go to university, come back, sit silently in a chair and then go to sleep, you will have technical skills that you've demonstrated from outside of your master's assignment. Okay? You've just got to, as I, as I say, compiling that list, reminding yourself of what you've actually done 
that might not immediately be on. Even better, get a friend to do it. Because we all know that we are probably the person who holds ourselves in the least esteem possible. Okay? And whether you'd like to believe it or not, people who know you probably think you're absolutely fantastic. My God, this person uses machine learning and AI to do all these magical things. They're amazing. So let them give their perspective. Let them tell you how great they think you are, because it will be a lot better than you think you are. Um, anyone else on that? What technical skills can we demonstrate that are, you know, what if I'm worried that all I've done is a master's thesis? I think actually make sure that you list the modules um, because I use those in the, um, the triage stage. Is it okay for me to just talk about the stages that we, we go through? So stage one happens literally as soon as the application closes, the deadline arrives. Um, my team and um, the skills team will triage. We will go through eligibility. And that's another thing I should probably add is check your eligibility. If you're coming into your write-up phase, you're not going to be eligible. You'll get thrown out immediately, OK? So just be 100% clear that you are in the right time frame, OK, for starting next October, OK? Um, I think the most important thing is, is that you are registered at a UK university. You have a right to study, which I know sounds crazy, but you would be quite surprised at the number of applications that we receive. So that's stage one, we check your eligibility. We will also check your skills as well. We will check that you're actually doing something that matches with the Turing, okay? So that's again, make sure that you get down everything. And I think that master's thing, that's the last big thing you did. Most of you will have done a master's. If not, you'll be on a foundation year. Sell yourself, sell yourself about what you have been doing. Okay, and I think you know, don't be afraid to put yourself forward. Um, so that's stage one, and we will probably lose somewhere of the region of about 80 or 90 applications at that point. Um, then we go on and we um, send the applications for stage two, which is the expert review phase, and this is where these people um, take over, and each application is reviewed twice. And there's quite a strict scoring criteria. We analyze that. We analyze bias. We, we, it's my job to make sure that the reviewers are fair, OK? And then once that has been done, which is usually over the Easter holidays, um, because this all takes quite a long time, um, we, then, um, we will then start to, my team will start to sort of sift through the scores um, and Last year, we certainly automatically allocated people with the two high schools, which is what happened with um, Kit's student. Um, and then we take to panel discussion, which is where Kit also sits on the panel. We will take, take a certain um, number through to discussion. We will divide them up between us and introduce your applications. We will pour over them and say, is this person right? OK, I will, I can tell you, because transparency is incredibly important for us, is that there are certain um, certain number, probably about 10 last year, that we actually had to, to put through a deselector because they were so strong. But we, we they, they came in that criteria we were discussing at panel, but a decision couldn't be made because people felt so passionately about those applications. So we actually put them through a random deselector, um, and therefore it was down to chance whether those people were selected or not. So if you, we can give you feedback. We can tell you where you were, when you were rejected, okay? And um, you know, certainly um, we analyze that quite a lot. Um, you know, we analyze the percentage of, of people who, who don't quite make, make the cut for whatever reason. You can apply again if you're doing a four-year PhD. Apply again if you want to. Um, the people, you know, we have so many applicants. We we won't know, and you don't have to. You don't have to disclose that you've applied once before. That's that's not an issue. So I think, you know, it's it's about being mindful of all those things. So we've got a lot of questions. So I, what I would try and do is rattle through these, gun as close as possible to a one-sentence answer. Yeah. 
for each of them. I think some of these are actually pretty, pretty simple. So, for instance, um, how much time would you would you recommend uh, giving to an application? Personally, I think you're asking the wrong question. Okay, the apps, uh, my first application probably took me two years. I got one from the RAN recently that took me two days. Okay, um, you will know when it's done. Generally speaking, you know you stop when it's when it's good enough. Okay, um, so another good question here, very good question. What would you count as a proof of good communication skills? Does anybody have a a solid, succinct answer to that? The most sorry, can I? Yeah. Yeah. The most obvious one is any science communication that you've done. That's the most obvious one, and that includes blog posts that you've had or stand-up that you've done um, in terms of science you won. So any communication like that. It also, communication skills can be proven through, um, like not, not exactly as the thing that is the most obvious, but also if you worked with people from an interdisciplinary field, it also shows that you managed to communicate your own work to people from another field. So that's already another evidence of communication. Um, so I would say just any, anything that you've done where you had to <laughs> communicate <laughs> your idea to someone that is not from your direct field would be a communication skill. Or even if they are, even if it's any piece yes. of group work where you've had to communicate to convey an idea or put something together. It doesn't just mean, communication doesn't just mean talking at a conference. Very nicely answered, thank you. Um, again, a very, I think this is going to be very quick to answer. What if you have a background in machine learning but not maths? That's okay. I, I mean, yes. I, I mean, a lot of people apply on the medical yep. side who, by definition, yep. will not have a rigorous mathematical background. So, decide, not a problem to the point where it, you know, we wouldn't even think about it when assessing these things. Um, okay. What other pitfalls do you see applicants often falling into? Alex, do you have one for us on this? I think, well, I, I think we, we touched on both of these already, but one is just not answering the question. Um, believe me, that's extremely common. You know, you really want to sit down and just think, what are they trying to get from me? And it's the same in interviews. You're trying to see what's the question behind the question, as it were. Um, but lots of people tell you what they want to tell you rather than what we're trying to, trying to, trying to hear. But then also just a lack of specialism. You know, it's one thing to say, I did machine learning. It's another to say it was uh, machine learning and the real focus was on, on explainability because that was the key bit that hadn't been done. There's no actual detail there still, but you're showing an awful lot more depth and I think actually you can do even better, but specific. So another one just come through. Is non-research experience taken into consideration in the application, e.g. industry experience? If so, how? OK, um, again, very, very good question. So there's two possible answers to this. If it's irrelevant industry experience, okay. If I'm doing some, ex if I'm doing a project on astronomy, and I've worked in, I've worked with AstraZeneca for a bit, probably not very relevant. So it may, it shows a certain type of mindset. So it would help a little bit, but not a huge amount. If you're going for an industry-focused project that's actually involving some kind of manufacturing, and you can say I've got first-hand experience of this process, then it will help a vast amount because it gives you what we call a pathway to impact. It means you can generate the idea and then put it into practice with your old chums from AstraZeneca. So the short answer is irrelevant, irrelevant industrial experience is still good because it shows that you're not just thinking, just thinking like an academic. Relevant industrial experience is exceedingly powerful. Any dissenting views on, on that? Brilliant. I think we're nearly there. Um, we've done how much time. Um, we've done communication skills. What are the best experiences to highlight in general in my application? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Um, Jane. Collaboration. Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And it's not just about what you want to get out of it. We want to know what you're going to put in as well. We've given you lots and lots of ideas today, um, and there'll be more coming from the interest groups and the DSG, which you're going to go off and find about, about afterwards. But it's not a one-way street, okay? 
it's it's got to be a two-way street and you're not going to win any points if it's just about you and what you want to do i want to collaborate with x y and z because they're the best in their field yeah <laughs> and <laughs> it's really important that you you think much more widely than that and also it's not just about collaborating with people in your field the whole point of the enrichment scheme is about collaborating with people outside your field um i think it was shuni who said that she found somebody who was ex exactly the opposite to her field and that's what worked really well for her that's exactly what it's about it's not about you remaining in your comfort comfort zone because what's the point brilliant um and i think i mean that my blunt and brutal answer to that would be anything that's relevant and sounds impressive frankly and especially anything that captures the imagination a little bit so i once did a zero g experiments in, in in a parabolic flight and i throw that in wherever i can because it takes gets people's attention and okay um anyone else i, I might just add you know, a, a real focus on where you want to go so it's not just this isn't a mile marker this is an enabler you know i want to be making medical device X, maybe, in, 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 my, in my case. And so I need Collaborator Y or whatever. And just having that eye on the end goal rather than anything else. OK, and I'll, I'll end with a, with a nice one. What's been your favourite application you've ever read? I might answer on the technical front. I, 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 I'm an engineer by background. I've read some really nice technical ideas of going, oh, I'd like to do that. You know, that, those are the ones that I quite enjoy getting, especially if I get frustrated of, oh, I, I could have done that. <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think for me, there was, um, there, was, there was one medical one from a person who had some industrial experience working with the NHS. And I remember just reading this and thinking, yes, this guy is actually going to save some lives if we let him do this. Um, so that's kind of that's the real pinnacle to aim for. If you most of you are working on something, but if it's climate change, if it's medicine, if it's anything, if I can read this and I can see immediately the big picture of where this will go in five, ten, twenty years, then that's an extremely powerful thing. You know, if I think that's going to save a life, that's going to help us fight climate change, that's going to help man get to Mars, that's you're already on a winner at that point. And, Pick um, an area that you know the Turing is very is very um, forward in thinking. Um, look at our Turing values. Look at our Turing. Look at the website. Get as much information as possible. Those are the ones that stand out. You really get under the skin of what we do here. Um, that really shines for me. Okay, and with that, I will close, and I will say, ask you to thank my panel members. Um, for being blindsided by lots of questions. And I think next we have uh, the introduction to the teams. There's a huge amount of experience amongst these people and what we want to do is for you, for them to introduce themselves to you and then we're in a free flow situation. So um, I will wind up after they have done this, but the idea is that you listen to all of them and work out who you want to go and chat with after this formal session has ended and we're in free flow. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Anthony. I help organize the natural language processing interest group. So if you're at all interested in learning with machine learning for text data, uh, for example, summarization or um, uh, anything related to uh, linguistics, uh, feel free to come join our interest groups. We meet uh, three times a month uh, on Thursdays and we host these uh, as hybrid sessions at the Turing. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to ask any more questions about this or would like to know uh, to join our sessions, uh, feel free to join our mailing list and speak to me after the session. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Giulio Chini. I'm one of the organizers of the Entrepreneurship Interest Group. And you can come talk to me if you're interested in commercializing your research, innovation and the regulation about innovation. We meet uh, um, once every two months and generally we organize events with people from industry or ex-students that have commercialized their research, or in general, people interested in data science, artificial intelligence, and innovation. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny. I help organize the Data Science for Mental Health Interest Group. So the name Data Science and Mental Health is quite broad. In general, um, that's what we're trying to, to tackle here is because there are so many different angles from which you could work with mental health data, be it at like the population level, for instance, looking at how COVID has affected mental health in the UK, or from a more um, methods point of view, applying different machine learning technologies for disease progression, let's say, or to help develop better tools um, in this domain. So there's a lot of different ways you could address this issue and um, how our interest group play into that is we have monthly meetings as well as other events that are um, currently held hybridly. And what we do is we try to invite speakers and facilitate discussions among our members um, who are both affiliated with the Turing and working in academia as well as within the industry so that we could encompass these different perspectives in our own research. So in short, if you know, you're interested, if you're working on, let's say, data science for mental health, or if you're simply interested in seeing how, I guess, like what the latest uh, developments in this field are, then please, uh, you're very welcome to uh, talk to me at the Ada Lovelace room with all the other interest groups, as well as just join the interest group. And I look forward to speaking with you soon. Uh, hello, I'm Sarah, and I represent the learning at the Turing area of activity here. Um, so currently that involves uh, live training events. Um, we're developing some online learning courses. Uh, and we also run a grassroots uh, training fund for people who are interested in setting up their own initiatives with training or knowledge sharing. Um, so yes, come and find me if you're interested in finding out more about any of that or if you have some ideas to share. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Bermani. I am responsible for the recruitment and uh, program development of the Turing Internship Network. The Turing Internship Network is the institute's internship scheme uh, that connects um, doctoral students with our strategic partners and collaborators. Um, we work with big corporations, um, charities, SMEs, um, governmental organizations, uh, non-governmental agencies. So we work with quite a lot of um, uh, strategic partners and collaborators. And with them, we offer unique three to six months um, internships uh, that you guys can uh, undertake full time or part time. Um, come talk to me uh, to learn more about the scheme, uh, the eligibility, um, and if you're interested in applying your technical skills and uh, research expertise in industry, this is the program for you. If you're looking to um, take a break from your PhD and explore new opportunities and build um, new connections um, to maybe benefit your future career, please come talk to me. And yeah, again, uh, if you want to acquire new skills uh, and knowledge, again, great opportunity. And great opportunities are available in this scheme. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Frank, and I help uh, run the data study groups. So DSGs are collaborative sprint style research activities where you get to apply what you've learned into real world data environments. Uh, we partner with industry, academia, charities, and the third sector, so we really do partner with everyone. We quite timely have opened a new call for this week uh, for our February 23 DSG, so please do come and see us. Uh, that one is focused on the environment and sustainability, so please do come and see us. I'm in that room by the drinks fridge, so yeah, hopefully see you soon. Hi everyone, I'm Sam Selvaraja. I'm the Academic Services and Wellbeing Manager at the Turing. Um, so our team manage the operational and welfare aspects of our PhD student programmes. My role oversees also wellbeing services for staff and students. So we support students from the point at which they accept their offer through to when they leave the Turing. There are an array of ways in which we support you. Um, and apologies for the, the background noise. It just seems to be when I'm speaking, maybe it's something about me. Um, so we're the first point of contact for students. We arrange onboarding and induction for you. We also support with pastoral issues that you might be experiencing. Um, so ultimately, we're here to support students. So if you have any questions about how we do that, please do come and visit us in the kitchen. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. 
Oh, we're saying it to me as well. Just <laughs> yeah, just us. Um, hi there, my name's Harriet McCann. I've been name checked a couple of times this afternoon, so here's the face to the name. Hello. Um, I'm Academic Programs Manager here at the Turing, um, and today I do a, different, a few different bits, but I'll talk to you about connections. So there's an initiative called Turing Connections. There's a LinkedIn group called that as well. If you fancy joining it, you're more than welcome. Um, and uh, at the moment, Turing Connections is the Turing's current vehicle for engaging with leadership of centres for doctoral training. So some of you here will be enrolled with a CDT or a DTP, and we may well be speaking to your directors and managers in the background. Um, the initiative really is kind of looking at the future, kind of what the future might look like in terms of engagement between Turing and delivering into and with PhD students. So that includes like trying to develop a network of cross-organisational PhD students, helping to helping to help you to improve your skills and behaviours um, that relate it to your research work, um, and importantly, kind of actually connecting with real world challenges so dsgs would be an example of that the turing internship network again another example so all of that probably feels a bit like i should be talking to your supervisors and your directors recognize that so come and talk to me if um not if you want me to sell the enrichment scheme to you because i think we've probably ticked that box today but if you're thinking i just there's a niggle, I don't know what it is, there's something that is specific to me and I want to talk it out. Um, if you feel like actually I'd like to start connecting with the Institute a bit more today, come and talk to me and I'll, I'll sort of you know bring my laptop along and I can show you how we can tailor that for you um, and give you some top tips. Um, yeah, thank you for, for having me. Oh, I've got a, I've got a mic. Oh. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to go off to your stations in readiness? And the students will come along to you shortly. I'd just like to pick up on Anna Bamani, actually. And I think it's, it's, it's quite important to talk to you about internships because that's another thing that makes eligibility a little bit clearer. If you've got an internship planned during when you would like to be doing the enrichment scheme, it means that you will be suspending your PhD to be able to do the internship. That makes you ineligible. You cannot suspend your PhD and be on the enrichment scheme. You can't, it, the combination doesn't work. You have to be in your research phase. So if you've got plans to go off and do an internship, don't apply for the enrichment scheme, okay? It's a kind of either or thing. Um, so, but do talk to Anna because she's got some great connections and also Harriet, um, if that's something. Also, if you're, you know, you think, oh, I'm actually about to start my write-up phase, maybe this is the time for you to go and do an internship. So I hope that, you know, if you can't do the enrichment scheme, we've got some other options for you today. And that's really important for you to go away and think about, we're not just the enrichment scheme. Today is the focus of the enrichment scheme, but actually, we're much bigger than the enrichment scheme. So I think that draws everything to the close, and I'd like to thank all the contributors today, and especially Jess, my colleague, who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes. So thank you for a round of applause. Thank you. I'd like to shout out to the events team as well, who have been absolutely brilliant um, running these two events. Um, they have, I mean, it's the best two events I've ever put on. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. And then to all our, our individual speakers, our panel members, to Kit, who's come all the way from Birmingham today. Um, you know, this is what it's all about. It's all about us collaborating with them as well. So thank you very much, everyone.